Okay, cool. All right, guys. Um, we'll get the uh, show started. Uh, so, thank you very much for joining another episode of you know Toronto's LVM uh, meetup. Um, this is now our fourth meetup. Uh, that, 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 that we have. It is really nice to see so many familiar faces as well as to meet a bunch of new ones as well. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, so uh, today is going to be a little bit different than some of the other ones that, that, that we've had. We wanted to gear something towards newcomers coming into, uh, coming into LLVM. Um, so, so what I would like to do is give you guys a little bit of a, um, you know, a bit of a background about about you know trends in compiler development and you know why it is such a hot field right now and in my opinion will continue to be for for, for quite some time um, and also you know a little bit about you know how to you know some tips about you know breaking in into into the field and finally about one of the cooler uh, opportunities out there to get involved which is the Google Summer of Code um, so let me dive right in. Um, and actually, before I dive in, I just wanted I just wanted to say, you know, hands up to anyone who is a contributor to LVM. Hands up, guys. Anyone who's a contributor to to, to, to LVM. All right, cool, cool. So all of you that want to learn something about LVM or talk to someone, you know, go talk to someone who had their hand up. Um, so. I've mostly gone through uh, some of the preamble. So, like like I said, you know, I want to talk a little bit about you know why this is a uh, golden age for for compiler uh, design. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is what say right off the top is that this is not an original thought of mine. Um, that that this is um, a a very uh, well known uh, and popular uh, presentation, uh, which I'll go through in a little bit. And uh, again, you know, talking a little bit about some of the trends, you know. You know, how do you get into open source compilers uh, development? A, a few tips uh, about that. Um, and how to, you know, working in open source compiler development as well. And then finally, like I had mentioned, you know, a bit about uh, one of the cooler opportunities in the, in the Google Summer of Code. Um, so as I had mentioned, uh, this whole concept, the golden age of compilers, why it is such an interesting time uh, in, in our industry and why I believe it will continue to be an interesting time for our industry for quite some time. Um, this was the keynote presentation at uh, Aspelos in 2021 from Chris, Chris Latner, who is the godfather of, of, of LVM. Uh, very highly recommend you listening to his, his, his talk. It's about a 30 minute talk. You know, go on YouTube and just look up Golden Age Compilers. It'll be the first thing that, that you find. It's a, very, it's a very cool talk, and I'm going to rip off about the first five minutes of the talk right about now. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, he really talks about you know, two big things that kind of are driving this whole aspect of you know, why it's a golden age for compiler, compiler uh, development. And the first, thing, the first uh, point is that you know, hardware complexity is really driving compiler opportunity. So, um, so, so hardware is getting harder. Hardware is getting more complex. You know, we take a look at you know, modern compute complexity. You know, we've moved from single core to multi core to now multi rack. And you know, we've got you know, we've moved from um, uh, 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 we've moved uh, you know into uh, you know no, no vectorization uh, uh, capabilities with, within within uh, CPUs. Um, you know, as we see uh, Moore's Law start to kind of level out a bit, you know, we've had to look for more innovative ways to keep on, you know, driving compute capacity. Um, and speaking of some of the more, uh, some of the ways that, that it's also evolving is, you know, accelerators are becoming more and more pervasive as you take a look, you know, FPGAs and GPUs uh, and the like, you know, and leading into to more difficult uh, and more complex issues uh, uh, regarding that. And now we're moving into even more domain-specific compute complexity as you get you know, specialized silicon that's being uh, devised for specialized, uh, for, for specialized areas of, of compute with AI really driving a lot of that. So as we start to see the whole landscape start to get more complex and difficult, I mean, really, one of the big limiting factors is how the heck do you program for these, for these uh, uh, kinds of things? And what it really means is that you need to have, you know, innovation in both modern compilers as well as programming languages to be able to develop for these kinds of systems. 
So some of the some of the issues that, that you have or some of the things that you, you have to look for is you know you know hardware and accelerator abstractions. How do you abstract this down to an area where you can actually program for these kinds of systems? Um, you know, like I talked about know, domain specific computing complexity, you mean you need also need domain specific pro programming models to be able to uh, to, to actually be able to to, 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 to program for, for one of these uh, systems. And finally, seeing that compilers are really still, you know, a really base part of, of, the, of, of the entire uh, stack, there is still a need for, you know, high levels of quality, reliability, scalability, and performance in any kind of compiler that, that you're developing. So, as, so basically, you know, the need for investment into compiler development is high and growing. Um, and like I said, you know, as long as things are going, to, as long as hardware is going to keep on getting more complex, and for sure it will, uh, the fact is that you're going to need compilers to be able to, to be able to actually program for these for these new kinds of you know uh, uh, systems. The second thing that's really driving the whole era of you know uh, of, of compiler design and again why it's getting so so hot is the fact of the move towards and the evolution of open source compiler technology so if we take a look at you know early compiler design classic compiler design when I first got into compiler engineering a few years ago or many years ago um, you know essentially you had a front end uh, for which you know you take any kind of source code well not any kind of source code a specific kind of source code uh, you know, you would be able to parse it, well, tokenize it, parse it, you know, do some analysis on there, uh, generate an intermediate representation, or IR, uh, they'll call it. Uh, and then you'll feed it into an optimizer, which will take that optimizer, you know, it will do all sorts of cool optimization techniques and make it a, an optimized version of the IR. Feed it into a backend that's going to be able to create machine code for a specific architecture, that, a specific target architecture. And this, okay, simple, uh, a simple diagram here, extremely expensive and exp extremely complex to, to design. So really, you only had you know the, the, the largest vendors out there, you know, that were actually uh, creating uh, uh, compilers because to, to undertake that kind of uh, that kind of project would be incredibly difficult. So this kind of moved to like you know. This whole concept of you know, reusable concept design, where if you could have a common intermediate representation here, um, then theoretically, well, I shouldn't say theoretically because this is what they actually did, was that you know you could you could have a front end for each. Oh wow, C plus plus C plus plus. I meant to say Fortran front end. Uh, um, uh, you could have you know a, a different front end for different kind of uh, source languages. Uh, feed them through their own uh, front ends. Uh, it would generate a common set of IR. That IR could be, you know, consumed by an optimizer, which again, like I mentioned, would 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 spit out an optimized version of that. And then you could have a number of different backends, uh, uh, you know, whether you have an x86 or ARM or PPC backend. Um, and then you could kind of mix and match the different front ends for each backend, and voila, you have you start to have, you know, a a a new compiler that you don't have to build from the ground up every, for every single programming language. Uh, you could mix and match them for you know whatever target architecture that you're looking for. And this was what was um, uh, this was you know this design was what was op was adopted by you know the GNU compiler connection or or, or, or GCC, which was really the first popular um, uh, uh, open source uh, uh, compiler architecture out there, and it's still, you know, the dominant, you know, implementation uh, today. Uh, well, for C++. <laughs> um, so, so uh, um, and, and what, the other thing that, the, that this introduced was all of a sudden you were able to have, you know, many different vendors uh, contributing to the exact same source code, so it's really started to lower that barrier in, of, of, of entry. You didn't have to build everything from the, from the ground up. You didn't have to do it alone. So this moves us into sort of like the next big leap in, in open source compiler technology, which was this idea of modular compiler design. And this was one that was adopted by, well, LVM. Um, and uh, in, in, this, in this sense, basically uh, uh, everything, uh, so one of the key design principles of, 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 of LVM was this whole idea of modularity where everything is implemented as in, in a set of libraries. Um, and each of these, what they'll call, what they would call passes, 
you can kind of plug and play uh, and, and, and put together your, you know, given the entire infrastructure, your, 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 comp your compiler design. So you would have, for example, uh, this nebulous blob called, called, called Clang, and there would be a number of passes, whether it be, you know, parsing, SEMA, or I, or GEN, or whatever. Um, you know, you have your optimizer, which will have a number of different optimization uh, uh, passes, and then CodeGen, which have a number of, of, of passes for CodeGen for, you know, whatever target platform that you're, that, that, you're, that you're compiling for. And you can start to mix and match with this. Like, you don't necessarily, you know, every single, op every single implementation for a, a programming language could have, you know, a different set of optimizations that, that it's applying and in a specific order. Um, uh, and not only that, given the fact that it was so modular and so reusable, you started to see that it was being used for more and more interesting, uh, for more and more interesting scenarios where, where you know, um, like even for like non-compilers, like for example, for, you know, like for the optimization of, 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 F, of SQL code, for, for example, was, was you know, a, a different way that people were starting to use uh, the LVM architecture. And again, um, uh, uh, the other interesting thing about LVM, uh, as compared to GCC, was also the licensing uh, agreement for this, where LVM had a much more permissive license and it allowed to, to have uh, uh, a lot of the vendors and, uh, to, to start to leverage uh, the LVM architecture for their own proprietary compiler solutions. So this brings us back to the whole, this, back to this concept of, you know, why is this the golden age of, of compiler design? Um, and why, you know, this whole move and the evolution into open source compiler development, you know, why has this really started to, uh, you know, uh, uh, build this momentum in, 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 in the industry? Well, first of all, the big thing is that it completely changed the economics of compiler development and lowered the, the barrier to entry. Again, you didn't have to start building everything from the ground up. You could reuse whatever parts you wanted to for whatever for whatever you know implementation you were you were striving for. Um, it also enabled innovation at a higher level because you didn't have to worry about implementing every single piece. You could you could really dr drill down into you know what areas could you contribute uh, uh, innovation, um, and uh, uh, and it kind of abstracted away all those other nebulous things that that weren't uh, necessarily important to you. Um, and, and again, you know, and talking about, um, you know, the evolution of hardware and how things are getting so much more complex, you know, it enables, you know, new hardware design um, that need innovation in compiling programming language technology. And it really allowed, you know, not just the big dominant vendors out there, hard, hardware vendors that could play in this space, but it really allowed for people to move into and, and contribute and, and work in compiler technology at a much, at a, at a much smaller level uh, as well. So this is all very cool. I think hope, I hope I've convinced you all that that yes, it's a very cool time to be in, in, in compiler development. And I think given all this, I think that it's fairly safe to say that it's going to be continued to be very important to get to invest in compiler development. I expect this to last for hopefully the rest of my career at least. <laughs> um, so that's cool. But um, but but open source compiler development, of course, is really hard. To, it's 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 very complex. It's very difficult. You know, how do you break into this? How do you how, how how do you start off? So I'll give you a few a few you know tips and tricks and 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 some 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 suggestions. Well, first of all, um, at least for those that are that are that are that are still students uh, here in a post secondary uh, institution in Canada, um, you can always take a course. Because pretty much all of them have an entry-level compiler design course of, so, uh, of, of sorts. This was the this was the textbook that I used when I took my entry-level compiler uh, compiler course. Yes, and I'm sure that all of you know that book very well as well. Um, you can always check the LLVM homepage uh, at LLVM.org. Uh, it's got lots of uh, great background about the LLVM project. Um, you can also learn lots about you know the documentation. Uh, you can also learn about you know what projects are, are going on. You know uh, there's lots of good information there that I would recommend uh, uh, going through. You can also join the conversation at uh, at discourse at um, uh, You know there is lots of, of uh, well basically the, at, at this uh, the message boards. You know they're, they're they're pretty much for every single topic. There's probably some conversation going going on about there. If you are a beginner to LLVM, I would very highly recommend 
going to the beginner page, and, and you know that's the place where you can ask you know all all you know the, the entry level questions that, that, that you're looking for. Uh, check out the quote the code on on uh, on GitHub. Um, I would really really highly recommend that you know if you just want to dip your toe in the water, just you know extract it. You know, build it locally. There are tutorials there that that like that can help you to to, to, to find out how, how, how to do that. Uh, join a working group. You know, maybe not necessarily an entry level step, um, but there are a number of working groups going on in in, in the community. Um, and uh, if you look up, you know, LVM uh, calendar, uh, you should be able to find this calendar also uh, fairly easily, and you can get an idea about all the different you know office hours and working groups that that are going on at any time. If something looks interesting, uh, you can join. Of course, like I said, maybe not entry level, but they are very nice people by and large. Um, and you know, good place to good place to ask, ask questions. And uh, the most important things you should join a meetup, especially this one. Um, <laughs> if you haven't already, please please join the LDM Clang uh, uh, Toronto socials. So whenever we do post a new uh, new meetup, uh, that you'll get notified of that, and that you'll be able to you know track you know uh, when these happen, which we are hoping to do so on a more consistent basis. And get a job <laughs> in the Toronto area. Um, you know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in the Toronto area, there are many, many, many companies out there that are involved in, in compiler development. And you know, when I started again quite a while ago, this was a much smaller list. You know, if you wanted to get into compiler development out of, out of, out of university, you had very, very few options available to you. Um, but, uh, but since then, and largely because of what I've been talking about up until now and about the explosion in, in, the, explosion in the industry, is the fact that opportunities are really growing and growing quite significantly and growing here in the GTA. Um, you know, the other thing they wanted to mention, you know, I, and I also took at a, uh, uh, also got a, a LinkedIn uh, uh, a research paper which talked about, you know, which universities are producing the highest number of compiler engineers. And in the top three, two of them were Canadian. Actually, in the th top three, two of them were from Ontario. Um, so, you know, you know, not only do I, would I say this is a good time to get into the compiler engineering uh, uh, industry, this is the right place to get into the compiler engineering industry. Um, but of course, yes, things are tight. <laughs> um, and, 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 and it's tough, but there are other opportunities, of course, to kind of break into this, this, this uh, area of, of compiler development. And one of those areas is, getting, is, is working on an open source project. And one of those open source projects that, that, that have been, uh, that, that the LLVM community has been involved with for many, many years is the Google Summer of Code. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Whitney. Um, who has been a multiple Google Summer of Code uh, mentor, and she's going to go through and talk to you a little bit about the program and a little bit about the project that she's worked on in the past. So my portion, I will talk about basically what I know about Google Summer of Code as a Google Summer of Code mentor. Uh, I will cover what is Google Summer of Code, its benefits, its timeline, and some tips, and share some past Google Summer of Code projects. Google Summer of Code is a global online program that has participants across more than 100 countries. As the name suggests, Google Summer of Code happened in the summer, where contributors get to work on an open source software with the guidance of mentors. So in the context of Google Summer of Code, uh, contributors means the mentees. They can be students or they can be beginners to the open source developers development. Uh, there are over 700 open source organizations working with Google Summer of Code. LLVM is one of them that have been participating in Google Summer of Code for a number of years already. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll be using LLVM as the example for open source organization. As mentioned earlier by Jeff, uh, LLVM is widely used both commercially and in academia research in the compiler field. 
Before we get into even more details about Google Summer of Code, let's first convince us ourselves why do we even care participating in Google Summer of Code. I separate the benefits into two perspectives. One is the contributor. So for contributor, they get to experience uh, real world application, the advanced technology, and also the workflow, like how do you uh, write, uh, motivate people when you write a re code review, how do you do testing efficiently, how do you do building such a big application efficiently, and so on. Uh, let you share your work with a big audience like the LLVM developer meeting. Enhance your professional experience, definitely something useful to add to your resume, and nevertheless, earn, earn some extra income. And on the mentor side, maybe less obvious because it's a volunteering work, but there's still a lot of great benefit, like it brings new contributors to the open source software development, especially on the area that you need more efforts on and grow your network so you get to know more other developer also working in LLVM but in other areas. Uh, achieve your goals slash ideas that you always want to do but it never reached to your priority list on the top of your priority list. Uh, help build reputation, very critical working in the open source uh, community. And finally for the company that you're working on it help you to uh, identify good developer early before they even try to find a job, you can approach them before they graduate. So it so far sounds interesting to you. Here's the over timeline, where Google Summer of Code in high level is split into three periods. First is the application period, then it's the coding and the extended period. Application period start as early as February, which is now, uh, where, uh, Mentors can put their ideas that they want to mentor in a web page. So for LLVM, it's the web page shown on the slide here. Uh, this is a snapshot I took last week. There already are more ideas that uh, added recently. And as you can see, uh, the ideas doesn't have to be in LLVM core. It can be any other project under the LLVM umbrella. For example, it can be a project for MLIR. And for each project, each idea, there will be a number of fields that need to be filled in, like the description of the project, which doesn't need to be long. It could be one paragraph, as long as it's clearly explained the idea. The expected result, desirable skills, uh, project size, which can be 175 hours for a medium project or 350 hours for a large project. They can be decided in advance by the mentor, depends on the project size or it could be decided by the contributor when they write their proposal, depending on the availability in the summer. And then it's difficulty, confirm mentor. For mentor, highly recommend to co-mentor with a lot of people in different uh, company, because it will save you a lot of time. And then uh, link to uh, this course post. So as you can see, the number of fields is not a lot, and each field is a sentence or so. So uh, the overhead of writing an idea is very low. The difficult part is to come up with an idea that fit for a Google Summer of Code project. <coughs> then next phase, uh, next step is in March where contributor can look at all the ideas and they can uh, find the one they're more interested in and go to the associate discourse post to ask questions. So every idea as mentioned earlier in the previous slide, there is an associated post in the discourse under the Google Sum of Code categories. And you can ask questions there to clarify the idea if you have any. And it's highly recommend to actually have conversation with the mentor beforehand. And in fact, that is actually a field being, we need to write it when we rank all the proposal, whether you talk to the mentor beforehand. Uh, so for a good proposal, it should include your tech of the idea, what do you think is the idea, how do you define success, some deliverable, how do you plan to achieve it, and when, so a detailed timeline, and a bit of yourself. How do you differentiate yourself compared to any other potential contributors? One tip for a good proposal is to submit early so that uh, the Mentors can give you feedback and you can adjust your proposal accordingly. 
So in April will be the deadline for the proposal submission. In May, uh, the mentors will gather all the submitted proposal and rank them. And in the same month, May again, uh, all the accepted proposal will be announced. All the accepted project will get to the next phase, which is the coding period. Coding period regularly is a 12-week period between June to September, where uh, contributor get to work with the mentor on what they proposed in their proposal. And in between this 12, week, uh, 12 weeks, there are two evaluations, one in the midterm in July, one in September at the end of the coding period. Uh, but you can see on the slide here, there's actually four evaluations. The reason is actually both evaluation are both ways. So mentors get to evaluate the mentee at the same time, mentee get to evaluate the mentor. One thing I want to bring up is for the midterm evaluation, uh, mentors is have the option to terminate the project early if if the uh, should I pause for the flakiness? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So if the mentor can pause it early if the result is much worse than expected. So we don't want that, and we don't want uh, early termination. So here are some suggestions that I gather with some other uh, mentors. Some suggestion to have a good project is to, uh, in the beginning of coding period, we spend more time upfront to determine the task for the contributor. So we get together, look at the proposal again, uh, redefine the task, re reorder them, and re adjust the estimation because the mentor knows better of the code base. And now for the short On the second suggestion. For the second suggestion is to block off more time for code review discussion. Um, usually for Google Summer of Code contributors, they take a lot of turnover in code review because they don't really understand what the comment is about. So if we can have meetings set up with them to better understand what each code review comment actually means, it can hugely reduce the number of turnover for a code review. And the first suggestion is to have frequent short meetings rather than rare long meetings because we find that contributors tend to have not proactively tell us what's the blockers. They like to wait when we ask them in the next meeting do, how's the progress? Do you have any blockers? And then bring it up. So having more frequent meeting can speed, speed up the whole process and maybe the problem is just so easy to solve. Just need to be bring up. Um, the other thing that happened at the end of the coding period is a final report, which is very useful when we get back in the future to look at some interesting project, what, if we want to continue co uh, contributing to those ideas, we can see what is already accomplished and what was suggested to further improve. So that final report is in the Google Summer of Code webpage forever uh, and it's easy to access. The one example uh, of showing that Google Summer of Code, even though this year is already the 18th year of Google Summer of Code, is always improving listening to feedback and changing according to the environment. As they, last year, they added this extended period. So uh, if both mentor and contributor agrees, they can extend the project from 12 weeks to 22 weeks to November, if needed. This is the overall uh, time, timeline again. Any question on the timeline? If not, I, I prepare free project that I mentored before to give you some inspiration maybe on your next Google Summer of Code project. The first one I want to share is called Instrumentation of Clang slash LLVM for a Compile Time. It's a project that I mentored last year. Uh, I bet at one point in time, what you guys have asked a question, especially when you're compiling your code. Why is it taking so long? And this project is aiming to answer that question. So on the uh, screen here, you see that there is a very simple compile line that's trying to compile the file t.c using the compiler clang and generating a binary t. 
behind such a simple line that actually the compiler have to go through a number of phases. Uh, for application developer point of view, there are various ways to improve compile time, like reducing the optimization level, but that sacrifice one time. Or maybe uh, restructuring the code, but maybe hard to figure out how to restructure to actually make it build faster. Or even it may not be possible because it's library code. So another way to think about it is to rely on compiler developer to improve the compiler to reduce the compile time. For a compiler developer to reduce compile time, they will need to run, compile a bunch of wide range of variety of uh, benchmarks and find out where is the hotspot, like the areas that in the compilers that taking longer time than expected. So good that LLVM already has such a mechanism under the option F time trace. When compiling with this option, it will produce a JSON file which you can plug it into Chrome browser and it will give you a chart that looks something like this. It will tell you how much time, uh, compile time is spent on different portion of the compiler. Uh, but there are ways to improve this whole process. First is accuracy. If you tell the compiler developer that the backend is taking so long to run my application, likely there's not too much they can do because the backend is gigantic. But if you can tell them this function is taking so long or this pass is taking so long, much longer than expected, uh, maybe there's something they can do. Maybe they can change the algorithm, they can reorder the pipeline, they can catch the analysis and so on. So by adding more counters, there can be more accuracy, but it, it's a tricky problem because we don't want to add too much. Uh, adding too much counters can affect the result because there's overhead on having a counter. Second is efficiency. We mentioned about there is overhead. Is there a way to reduce the overhead? Is there a way to change the implementation to make it more robust? So that's the second way. Third way is usability. Uh, as an example from the student last year, if he find that when using app time trace option and gen generating a binary instead of an object file, the JSON file is placed in TAM directory, which is very not user friendly because who would have expected it to be in the temp directory. So one thing he did is to change the destination of the JSON file to be in the same uh, folder as the output uh, result. This kind of project is very open-ended. It gives the flexibility to the contributor to decide what they're interested uh, to work on, uh, how do they want to approach this problem. And this is also very it uh, gives them exposure to different areas of the compiler. The second project I want to share is called Utilize Loop Nest Pass. Before we work on this Google Summer of Code project, the concept of Loop Nest Pass was added quite recent at that time. And we didn't have any example that leveraged the concept of Loop Nest Pass. So we figured that it would be a good opportunity to use the resource from Google Summer of Code to modify some existing transformation to use the concept of loopness. So by using uh, the concept of loopness, there are three benefits. First is improved compile time because now when we are dealing with loopness pass, it is traversing by loopness instead of traversing by loop. It better code generation because you have a bigger scope. Uh, the transformation can do better judgment yeah, according to the whole loop nest instead of a single loop. And finally, it helps preserve some loop nest property. One example of a loop nest property is a perfect loop nest, where it means there's no intervening code between two level of loops. And having such kind of property can help hugely reduce the complexity of some transformation like the loop interchange and loop unroll and jam. We did a presentation in 2021 LLVM developer meeting. Here's the link. If you're interested, you can go there um, for more details about this project. One fun fact to share is the contributor who present with us in that uh, meeting, in that presentation, he actually got a job after this Google Summer of Code project in Sci-5. I'm not trying to say that by working in Google Summer of Code, a project you get a decent job in a decent company after, but it definitely helps show that uh, your willingness and your ability at the same time let you know if you are comfortable and happy to work in an open source community. Uh, this, in contrast to the previous project, this one is more focused. 
it gives you a deep dive on a single topic, this, uh, on loop transformation in particular in this case. And finally, the last project I prepared is called Unified Ways to Move Coal or Check if Coal is Safe to be Moved. The idea of this is pretty much covered by the topic itself. There's a lot of transformation that's trying to do these two things. On the slide here, I have three loop invariant coal motion, loop sinking, and loop fusion. But this is just a very, very small subset of all these transformations trying to do these things. And this project, we want to have a consistent answer when we query where the uh, instruction is safe to move in a particular point in the program and also have a consistent way to actually do the movement. So this is this kind of project is a very classic kind of uh, Google Summer of Code project that do refactoring. Re yeah, refactoring. So I prepared three different flavors of Google Summer of Code, but that's, there's actually so many more other flavors of Google Summer of Code. In summary, Google Summer of Code is a programming project on open source software under the guidance of Mentor. It can be 12 weeks to 22 weeks. Uh, it benefit, has great benefits for both the contributors and mentors. It starts every year in February, which starts now again. Uh, it consists of many different kind of projects. You should be able to find one you want to contribute or you can come up with one that you want to mentor. So last thing, the next deadline approaching is April 4th, which is the deadline for the proposal submission. That's all I've prepared. Thank you. <laughs> Question. Um, and before we move to, 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 to questions, I forgot to mention right off the top, um, I had a couple of ulterior motives uh, for, for this project. Uh, number one is that, you know, we really want to encourage, you know, new contributors to join the LPM community. Um, so, so like, like uh, Whitney had mentioned, you know, this is a great opportunity. April 4th is the deadline to, um, for, for, for applications. Uh, try to get them in uh, as, as as quickly as possible. And the second ul ulterior motive that I that I had for for this was to attract more mentors to to, to the program uh, as well. If you have any ideas, you know, Whitney shared a couple of them. But if you have any ideas, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to introduce new people to the to, to the project, possibly get some work done. I can tell you right now that that uh, I suppose that my third or third or third or third ulterior motive is that I do have a couple of projects that I wanted to propose, but I'm looking for mentors to help me push them through uh, both in the area of Clang, both in the area of, of language development. So anyone, and I know there are some Clang people here, um, with knowledge in Clang and you know, knowledge in, in, in you know, language standards work, uh, if you're interested in, in participating in a project like that, please let me know afterwards. Um, so with that, let's get to the Q&A. <laughs> Sure. All right. Um, I find that uh, working with uh, with you know junior developers sometimes they can be you know intimidated and uh, be reluctant to propose the great ideas that they have. Do you have uh, pointers, both from a mentor perspective and from a, from a contributor perspective, about how to overcome this barrier of uh, you know to, to really encourage a junior developer to uh, to present you know to, to come forward with their with the great ideas. Mm -hmm. No matter how crazy they may sound. Maybe you wonder. Repeat the question. Oh. <laughs> that. You really think that someone couldn't hear me? <laughs> and can hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because we're, fa we're facing the mic. <laughs> uh, so the question is sometimes the contributor or the mentor may be fa uh, fear to bring up the topic. The mentee. The mentee and the mentor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. The mentor and the mentee will be fair to suggest their great idea. Yes. So my answer will be actually that uh, for sometimes mentor may be uncomfortable because they don't understand the whole Google Summer Code process, how it actually happened. So they could actually for uh, accept a project, they can contact the confirmed mentor and see if you can co-mentor with them or if you can just listen in, contribute that way. 
So you get comfortable, you understand the whole process, and next year you will feel more comfortable to bring up your new idea. Does that answer your question? From the mentors. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mentee side. I think you mentioned one of them right during your presentation, which is, and, and I would encourage the mentors, um, frequent meetings, to frequently have discussions with, with the mentee to check in to see how things are going, even if they're just short. Mm -hmm. In fact, preferably if they're if if they're short, rather th rather than booking you know a big chunk of time you know once a month, you know having a check in or perhaps multiple check ins per per week just to see how things are going, so you can sort of like you had mentioned mm -hmm. uncover those blockers, yes. fact you know quickly sooner rather than later. Yeah, having discussion help confident their idea. Yes. So. Uh, Okay. <laughs> you go, you oh, okay. You you go first. <laughs> go first. No. No. Okay, so my question is, you presented three different kind of Google Summer of Code project. Mm. Two that are more narrow and deep, and one that was kind of like an idea of improving compile time, very open-ended. Um, the Which type of project, in your experience, students tend to do better? Okay, good question. Uh, for these three topics, uh, particularly the one that is most successful is the utilized Snoop Nest Pass. The reason is we actually, uh, in our own compiler, we already leverage, uh, we already know how to do it. So when helping with the student, we have concrete result on concrete ways how to leverage it so it's easier to help them rather than the other way we actually didn't do it before so we're actually exploring the route with the contributor together. I, I would say that the, that the more focused projects are better. Mm -hmm. um, I know we talked to another mentor beforehand and, yeah. and he had given some feedback from one of his projects from last year and what he had said was that their project definition was too vague and that he had wished that they had spent more time up front with the mentee really kind of crystallizing you know what the the the, the real definition of the project was and they think that if it had been more focused it would have been more successful because it took them a long time to get traction on on, on the project so yes more focused I mean, actually, I guess I guess the topic doesn't necessarily need to be focused, but right. you need but you need to you know kind of drill down pretty quickly, I think, to to, to to get it. That's why I think uh, the idea can be broad, but in the very beginning of the coding period, the getting together portion before the project start to understand what the contributor interested in and then narrow the idea at that point will be sufficient. So oh. His question for uh, Yeah, uh, I just wanted to know if the contributors could submit, because there's a process where you go through the list and you pick out the uh, topics that you like and yeah. you create a proposal. Can they submit multiple proposals? And because you have to get some, uh, approved. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to approve for one, you don't have to yes. The question is can contributors submit multiple proposal? The answer is yes, although you could only be accept for one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you give a Sorry, follow-up question. Do you give ranking preference, or is it just? No, I don't think you get ranking pre preference. You can email the mentors in the background. They yeah. then they know. Because you have to run. Yes. Yeah, because the, the mentors themselves, I believe, have veto power. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. question. So, um, how many, like, how often do these projects get contributed back to open source? Do they all get contributed back, or are they kind of just usually siloed? Um, or does it depend on the project? Mm -hmm. The question is how many of the efforts get contributing back to the open source? Uh, the answer is depends on the projects and depend on the quality of the student as well. Uh, if they are efficient enough and they're comp you should actually, the advice is work on the open source uh, project directly. But sometimes maybe all the ideas they have are stuck in the code review process. Then it never lands into the project itself. But if we, small, um, if we can do deliverable, we can break the problem into smaller chunks, then the chances of more of them get 
uh, landed into the open source project is high. I think the question was kind of what frequency do we expect that to be? Half of them deliver something to the community or less or more? The question is how frequent is the delivering back to the open source so code base? The frequency with my narrow sample of three of them will be the first one, all of them get delivered some portion. Uh, but not everything. Yes. You mentioned that the uh, mentee uh, got some uh, pay out of the, uh, the project. Uh, as a mentor, does your company provide that pay? How does that work? Oh, so mentee, do, do mentor get to pay is the question. Mentor get to pay by their own company for their own job, and this is a volunteering work. <laughs> but I think I, no. I think your question was, does 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 uh, does the company pay the mentee? Correct. Right. Yeah. So like, do I need to get approval to oh. pay the mentee? No. So the so the um, I mean Google pays the mentees. I mean they they, they, they do do all that. But I believe that um, the individual uh, open source communities fund. Google. <laughs> I do believe that there's that 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 there's uh, um, like for example the LVM Foundation. I do believe does uh, um, have some funding responsibilities for the, the the mentees. So it's so it's the open source community themselves, not the individual you know companies that yes that that you know the mentors likely work for that that fund these projects. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Let's say. Um, Let's say a sum, uh, this uh, mentee sum of the code is down, right? And then the code is in the reviewing process. And who is going to respond to be responsible to follow up those things? Okay, so the question is, if uh, the code is during is in code review, who is responsible for delivering the code? Exactly. So, so uh, the Google Summer of Code one of its goal is to bring newcomers to the open source development. So. We hope that the uh, mentee will continue to work in the open source, so it's their responsibility to actually land it and address all the review comments, but they're not forced to do so because they no longer get paid. So if they decide to just not do anything, they can do that and go back to school, but it's highly encouraged to do that, and if they don't, maybe the mentor can continue their work. Is there a maximum number of mentees um, accepted for a project? Yes. So, uh, in the in the um, um, ranking process, we have to rank all the submitted proposal, and they will submit this ranked proposal to Google, and then Google will tell us back how many spots do we get. Yes. What is the time commitment as mentor? What's the time commitment for a mentor? Uh, depends on how many mentors you have in the project. That's why I say highly encouraged to have more. Uh, usually at least one meeting per week, and then also including the code review time, and if they have, they're willing to proactively ask you questions, then there's more time involved in those areas. Looks like that we don't have more questions. Okay, great. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Whitney, for taking us through the Google Summer of Code process and some of her experience. Uh, I really, really appreciate you uh, going through that. Um, all right, so we can wrap up here. Uh, so again, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining. Um, if you are a potential mentee, Please take a look at, at, at the list of projects if anything you know tickles your fancy and and uh, and uh, uh, um, you know also engage in the, in the discussion uh, forums um, and you know theoretically if you are a potential mentor and want to, wanted to propose a project we should have done that about a week ago but um, but but uh, say la vie, we still have time to, to, to do so so uh, if you do want to pr propose a project please do so. 
at this point super quickly. <laughs> um, okay, so with that, uh, again, thanks everyone for, for, for joining. Please please join the LVM meetup, sign up so you get notifications when we when we have new meetups coming coming in. And please enjoy yourself. Please enjoy the pizza at the back. I don't know about you guys, but I'm hungry. <laughs> All right, thanks guys.